Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, uh, today's talk in our alumni leadership lecture series. Uh, this is the last talk for this uh, semester. I know that you must be enjoying your exams, so I don't want to interfere with your <laughs> enjoyment of your exam week. Uh, so this will be the last talk for this semester, and then uh, we'll, we'll resume in January after you come back and after Shastra and Sarang are over. So the next talk will we'll schedule some, sometime around middle of June, I mean middle of January. Um, so I want to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Kumar Daresami. He is uh, an 83 B.Tech Mechanical Engineering from uh, IIT Madras. And as he says in his bio, that is the most important aspect of his bio. So, uh, but he's, um, he, he does have an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a recipient of an IBM Wharton Fellowship. He also has an MS in Mechanical and Aerospace Science from University of Rochester, where he was a university fellow. Um, he's also the spouse of an IIT Delhi alum, but we will forgive him for that, I suppose. Um, he started his finance career in 1989 at Salman Brothers, where he did fixed income and derivatives research. He is currently managing partner at Angle Light Partners LP. Uh, not Angel Light, right? Angle Light. It is Angle Light. Uh, it's, it's a hedge fund that uses process-driven methodologies to systematically identify and exploit dislocations in global stock, currency, commodity, and fixed income markets. Um, prior to starting a Angle Light, he served as managing director and member of the executive management committee at Natixis Capital Markets. And before that, he launched the capital markets businesses for Commerce Bank, and he was a member of several management committees that set the overall strategic direction for the bank's activities in the US. He has also spent 10 years in senior structuring and marketing roles at Bankers Trust Deutsche Bank, where he was variously recognized for bringing innovative thought processes and solutions to complex cross-product risk problems. His uh, talk for today is, is titled Wall Street, Engineering, and the Case for Greed. And I'm sure it's this very provocative title that has brought so many of you today to hear him. So. I will I, without delaying it further, I'll invite Kumar to deliver his talk. Thank you, Professor Nagarajan. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, uh, I want to thank IIT for giving me this wonderful opportunity to come back to the defining institution of my career. Um, uh, I spent five years here. I'll get, to, get a little bit into the detail of the next slide of my experience at IIT, uh, but it changed me as an individual. So it gives me enormous pleasure to come here and talk to all of you. Uh, the topic is going to be slightly different from other lectures that you have seen in the series. There has been a lot of talk about entrepreneurship. This has more of a finance slant. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, I want to thank the audience for taking the time from uh, your exam schedule to come and listen to me today. Uh, the topic I have uh, chosen is Wall Street Engineering and the Case for Greed. A um, couple of these terms, Wall Street Engineering, I think I have uh, some special insight into, having worked in those areas for about 20 plus years. Uh, greed, I think everyone has some idea about greed. Uh, all of us experience it. It is a part of what I call the human condition. And uh, usually there's a very negative connotation to greed. Uh, people don't like it. People have uh, a negative view on it. Uh, and usually that is correct. The intuition is correct. Uh, but obviously it's a very powerful force. And the question is, is there something that we can do about it, something that can be done to marshal it and use it effectively? Uh, so that is the focus of this uh, talk of mine. Uh, and I will use two examples, one from technology. Uh, after all, this is a technical institute. So we'll use one example from technology. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the crisis of 2008, where things got a little bit out of control. And I'll end this talk with the discussion about how something can be taken from the crisis. You can always learn from a crisis and uh, apply it in a socially responsible way to a completely different area. It's, it's almost like a thought experiment, 
but it's a very interesting idea, and I want to share that with you, and I will conclude with that. Um, with that, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, my background that will provide some context. I say, who am I? It's a deeply philosophical question, but uh, I'll provide a very mundane answer. I'm a 1983 B.Tech mechanical engineering graduate. Uh, I think the defining thing for me was I, was I never stayed in the hostel. I was a day scholar all five years of, uh, uh, of my stint at, uh, at IIT. Uh, so I have a different perspective than a lot of you. Uh, a lot of the students here, I did not, I saw only the downside. I never saw the upside of hostel life. Uh, I had a completely different experience than most, most of my friends. Uh, but having said that, uh, it is, uh, I, would, I would not change, the, change a thing. It took me a couple of years to get used to the system of working with some of the brightest minds in the business, learning from some of the best professors in the business. Um, but it left me with this wealth of confidence that has stood me in good stead all along, right? So I was a day scholar, and I, after I finished my BTEC, as was the case in those days, uh, about 90, 95% of the class decided to go to the US. And I went along. I went along for the ride. Applied for a PhD program, got admitted, and uh, I realized, uh, pretty much within six months of getting there, that I was not cut out for a PhD. Uh, and the reason was very simple. Um, I did not have the patience to work uh, single-mindedly on one problem for an extended period of time. So I had to make a choice. I started applying for jobs and finally got an offer from a very small startup company in upstate New York. Um, Pay was ridiculously low, and the reason it was low is uh, they could pay me low because I didn't have a green card, and uh, that was the deal. But I took it, and I stayed with that company for about, for about three years, and this was an old school startup. Now, I know a lot of you are interested in entrepreneurship, and you're looking for VC funding, and you know, private equity, and there's a lot of jazz that goes along with startups. But this guy who ran this company, he funded it out of his own pocket. He was not looking for any sort of VC funding, nothing. He was not looking to take the company public. You know, so the upside was pretty capped. You know, you're going to make, you started off low, you're going to make a little bit of money, and that was it, right? Uh, so along the way I got, I said, you know what, I, I need to get out of this place. And the ticket to get out was to try and apply to MBA schools. Um, so I applied. Um, to a bunch of schools and got admitted into Wharton, and I was there uh, for, to do an MBA for a couple of years. Now, the interesting thing here, I'm talk, I, I want to talk a little bit about my experience at Wharton because uh, when I went to Wharton, I had absolutely no idea or no interest in finance. I knew nothing about finance. I had worked as an engineer for three years, and I wanted to become a management consultant. I wanted to join McKinsey, Bain, one of these companies. But uh, as luck would have it, the stock, this was 87. And for those of you who are familiar with finance, there was a huge stock market crash in October of 87. That happened as soon as I went to business school. And that uh, all of a sudden changed the dynamic in school. All these guys, now Watson is well known for finance. So everybody who was wanting to become a finance guy suddenly discovered that they had no interest in finance and wanted to become a consultant because the stock market had crashed. This is the interesting thing about an MBA, by the way, right? I mean, it's not unlike an engineering degree where you actually go to learn, learn things. With an MBA program at these schools, your goal is to get a job, right, and multiply your salary. So this was my first exposure to, uh, I'd been working in this sort of ratified atmosphere, but the first real exposure to what I would call monetary greed, right? where people can flip entire career choices right, on some very short-term event. Right? Uh, so I had gone there trying to become a consultant and suddenly discovered I was competing with 10 times the number of people that I thought I would be competing with. I wasn't getting the jobs. Uh, and I was getting desperate along the way. I decided to get married. 
So now there's additional pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, just completely by chance, I came across an article about the research group at Solomon Brothers uh, that was headed by actually a very well-known guy, a research guy in finance. I read the article, I wrote him, in those days this was before email, right? So I wrote him a longhand letter, not asking for a job, but just saying that it was a very interesting article. And uh, the guy calls me back, I mean, or the secretary calls me back, and I still remember this call. She calls me back and says, Mr. Dorai Swami, and I'm a student, she says, uh, Marty would like to know whether you can make time on your calendar <laughs> for a meeting. <laughs> Clearly, there had been a miscommunication between Marty and this woman, right? So I said, sure, I'll make time. So I went up to New York. I had one meeting with this legend in fixed income research, and I was hired. Now, the reason I bring this up is there's a lot of randomness in life, right? I mean, things happen, and when they happen, you think it's the worst thing that happened to you. I never wanted a job in finance, so I accepted the job very reluctantly, very reluctantly, because, but I had to because that's the only thing I had, right? Uh, but you slowly grow into things and begin to like them over time. So here we are like 20 years later, you know, I think I have, I've loved the finance work that I have done. It's, uh, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail, right? Now, Solomon Brothers, for those of who, uh, who are familiar with, the, with, the, with finance, uh, was a very famous firm. They were known as the kings of Wall Street in the 1980s or the early 90s. They were competing with the Goldman Sachs of the world, right? And here was an interesting phenomenon. So I joined this bank, and this ties into uh, the greed aspect. I joined this bank, and I'm making much more money than I ever made as an engineer, right? But within a year, I'm feeling very unhappy. And everybody around me is unhappy also. And there's no rational reason for it. The, rash, the only thing that you can think about is Wall Street had created this pressure cooker type environment where people are not actually comparing themselves with some global average of what other people are getting paid or uh, some, you know, what some engineer is getting paid in some other industry. You, you're focusing on the six guys around you, and that's all matters. So if, you're getting, if you feel that you're getting underpaid relative to the five or six guys around you, uh, then there's a problem. And there's a good chance that you'll get underpaid because uh, there's a good chance that somebody is getting underpaid, not you personally, because Wall Street makes hard distinctions on pay. There's no, they don't try to equalize things, right? They try to separate, quote unquote, the winners from the losers, right? So that leads to a lot of angst, right? And I found myself within a couple of years, despite having a very good job, I was infected by this greed, right? So I was like, well, I need to get out of this place. <laughs> uh, after I'd worked for three years quite happily, earning like one fifth the amount at this other engineering firm because everybody around me was making the same amount. And so I ended up working at a bunch of different firms. Uh, Professor Nagarajan talked about the, uh, the career arc. And currently, I'm running a, a fund called Angle Life Partners, where we trade you know, using some systematic computer models. So that is the, uh, I wanted to begin with this slide so to give you a bit of perspective on, uh, on, the back, on my background. So with this, we'll get into the meat of the presentation. And my first example is about 